It was the biggest thing happening in the whole world. 50,000 cheering people jammed Floyd Bennett Field in New York just before midnight, July 22, 1933. Wiley Post had just landed after circling the globe in his legendary airplane, the Winnie Mae. It was as if the whole world stopped for this moment. As Wiley pulled himself through the hatch on top of the plane, a tidal wave of screaming thousands engulfed the Winnie Mae. Wiley, a sixth grade dropout with a prison record and only one eye, had become the toast of the world, the first man to fly around the earth alone, the father of modern aviation. America in 1933 was in the midst of the Great Depression and desperately needed a hero. That hero was Wiley Post of Oklahoma. Wiley was born in Texas in 1898, but soon moved with his sharecropper family to southern Oklahoma, just before statehood. They settled near Maysville, where Wiley in the sixth grade dropped out of school because he was far more interested in repairing farm machinery and adventure. In the early 1920s, Wiley got on the wrong side of the law when he hijacked cars by throwing tires out into the road near Ninnecaw in Grady County. He was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in the state penitentiary. But after 13 months in prison, two prison doctors diagnosed Wiley with melancholy or depression, and he was paroled. Ever since he had seen his first airplane at age 13 at the county fair in Lawton, Wiley knew he would someday be a pilot. He signed on with the Burl Tibbs Flying Circus as a parachute jumper. Tibbs and his pilots and acrobats barnstormed through many towns in Oklahoma and Texas. Between parachute jumps, Wiley picked up a few hours of pilot instruction. In 1927, Wiley desperately wanted his own airplane. He took a job in the booming oil field at Seminole, promising himself to work just long enough to buy a plane. Tragically, on his first day on the job, steel from a co-worker's sledgehammer struck Wiley's left eye. Infection set in, and the eye was removed. Wiley faced a giant hurdle in his dream of becoming a commercial pilot. With a sixth grade education, one eye, and a prison record, how could Wiley ever succeed at anything, much less become a commercial pilot? With his workers' compensation settlement, he paid $240 for a wrecked airplane and another $300 to have it repaired. Wiley Post finally had his own airplane. Well, I was just a... Uh little snotty-nosed kid uh, in the 20s before he ever got to be famous and he lit in Marlowe and picked me up and we were going to fly to Maysville and somewhere between Alex and Lindsay that old airplane quit and he had a forced landing and fixed it some way and we took off and went on to Maysville. So I met, I went, uh, my, while he several times on the airstrip so I, uh, that's in the early 30s and uh, in several of the airstrips we'd land uh, there was no airport we landed in strips and uh, he had his um, old plane I had mine and I just met him it's just like we didn't know it he'd be uh, such a celebrity at the time, he was just one of the barnstormers that I had to meet. The pilots were generally calm, cool, collected type. He was definitely that. He was sort of bashful, in a sense, because uh, it was hard for me to get to know him. I just couldn't run up to him. But my dad would uh, say, go ahead, go talk to him. Because Wiley would be out there helping with the plane. And 
uh, getting it ready for some flight or other. Wiley stored his plane in my father's hangar that was out there at the, the old municipal airport. And he, he did it because it was convenient and kept it out of the weather. As barnstorming became less profitable, Wiley landed a job as the chief pilot for Chickasha Oilman F.C. Hall. Mr. Hall sent Wiley to California to buy a new Lockheed Vega airplane, and he named it after his daughter, Winnie May Hall. When Wiley was not flying for Mr. Hall, he was able to use the Winnie Mae for his own projects. Wiley Post, during the early part of the 30s with Will Rogers, was always uh, in the background. Uh, Wiley didn't come forward. He sort of respected, I, I felt, at the times that I photographed him for Paramount News, uh, he respected Will Rogers' position and he let him be center stage and be the actor and uh, Wiley played the part of the quiet pilot and uh, very seldom did Wiley say anything or even get in the conversation he just stood back and let Will Rogers do all the talking and of course Will took care of that all right. I was working late at the airport this was on southwest 29th in May and we were waiting for an airplane to come in, and it turned out to be Wally. And he was flying, I don't remember what it was now, but he held a flashlight out this window in order to see the land because he didn't have any landing lights out there. And he was bringing some woman in who was to a mercy flight to go to a hospital somewhere. And that's when I first met Wally. February the 4th, 1931. And Wiley called and told Daddy that he and Wiley, he and Will Rogers would be down to Duncan at a certain time and for me to meet him. So I got my plane. I went down and I met, the, met him down there at the airport. And he introduced me to Will Rogers that day. I guess that's the reason it stands out in my mind. So I've seen him fly the Winnie Mae a number of times. And um, uh, particularly out of the... the okay uh, municipal airport at 29th and uh, South May and uh, but uh, then I've seen him fly in different places but most of the time it was at the municipal airport and Wiley was just a fellow who was trying to make a living with uh, carrying passengers and eventually of course he got jobs of flying people here and there that Winnie May, it was just, it was so slick that it landed real fast. It was polished out and, uh, uh, well, it didn't have the wing area that the other planes had, so it naturally that meant that you was flying pretty fast to keep it a, a, in air. No, it was a real slick plane, that Winnie May. Well, just a big old monoplane uh, by today's standards. Uh, I guess the back seat would be like sitting on a divan, uh, but uh, I never was up. I never touched the airplane. I was never that close to it or anything like that. But, uh, and the Winnie Mae is probably two and a half times the size of a 195 Cessna, and they're pretty good size single-engine airplane, but uh, it was a big airplane. Tires on it <laughs> considerably bigger than what they put on now. The Winnie Mae was the first plane that we saw that appeared to be really a, uh, what I'd call a fancy plane. Now, we had seen Art Goebel's Woolerock, and comparing the two, they probably would have been somewhat equal in quality. By 1930, Wiley was bored with cross-country flying. He wanted to fly around the world and convinced F.C. Hall to back him in his attempt. In the spring and summer of 1931, Wiley and Australian navigator Harold Gaddy spent much of their time preparing for the trip. The New York Times bought the exclusive rights to cover the trip around the world. The newspaper promised its readers a real scoop in aviation history. 
On June 23, 1931, Wiley and Gaddy lifted off from Roosevelt Field in New York. For eight incredible days, Wiley flew a path charted by Gaddy through Newfoundland, England, Germany, Russia, Alaska, Canada, and back to New York. They were instant heroes when they landed in New York. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, talk about excitement. The Winnie Mae is back safe and sound less than nine days after she started from this very spot. A peach of a landing, and the boys are home. Home after one of the most thrilling episodes in the history of travel. It's a strange scene, it's almost dark, and the big plane looks like some prehistoric flying animal. Just think, nine days for a trip that took Magellan three years to make in 1532. The crowd's in a frenzy, the photographer's flashlights are sounding off like a battle scene from all quiet on the western front to welcome home the most popular heroes in the land. It's a wonderful ovation for Wiley Post, the one-eyed oil driller from Chickasha, Oklahoma, and is he thirsty? and Harold Gaddy, the quiet navigator from Australia, with Post as his wife. Mrs. Gaddy's rushing in from California to greet her husband. It was an hour before they could get away from the crowd. They've gone through many a hardship, and they got away from them in great shape, but their worst experience is in getting away from their friends, and what they want now is sleep. Well, sweet dreams, boys. At the Battery, the reception festivities are started off by the familiar fireboat salute in honor of Post and Gaddy and their wives, a real family reunion for the first time since the flight started. Their greeting down at the tip of Manhattan Island is nothing to what's coming later on in the big parade up Broadway on the way to City Hall. Everybody wants to get a look at the men who made aviation history. They're bewildered by the reception and they can't believe that it's all in their honor. The ride uptown is a triumph. Waste baskets are empty. Ticker tape fills the air. Torn up telephone books make the hot July day look like a snowstorm. Although every once in a while someone throws a phone book and forgets to tear out the pages. It's the nearest approach to a Lindy reception since that other famous flight in 1927. It's one of the most astonishing sights in the big town and a great tribute to a couple of great boys. Everybody's just tickled to death except the street cleaners who have to clean up the mess and into City Hall for New York's official greeting. And here they are now, talking to our cameras. Well, Wally, we've got a lot more flying to do yet. Oh, I'm glad of that. I like the opportunity to get around the country and see all the people who have been so kind to invite us to come to their cities. And Stanley, you have quite a little more navigation to do, too. Well, I think it'll do a lot of good to stimulate the interest in aviation all over the country. The unusual feature of the tour will be that we'll be meeting the people at the airports and not in halls. At the time this was uh, happening in 1931, we lived in Rush Springs in Grady County. And uh, the uh, round the world flight of uh, Wiley Post and Harold Gaddy had been uh, finished on July the 1st, I believe. And uh, so in the month of July, a little later, uh, we bundled in the car and drove up Chickasha, which was 20 miles away in our county seat. And they had the uh, Winnie Mae and uh, Wiley and uh, Harold Gaddy were all there on, on display, so to speak. They were barnstorming around the state and uh, attracting large crowds everywhere that they went. I was eight years old at the time and uh, enjoyed the trip very much and especially when we arrived in Chickasha, uh, the Winnie Mae was of course the center of attention. We must have been a little bit late because it was already on the ground by the time we got there. It was a tremendous airplane and really thrilled all of us to, uh, to see it uh, finally. We'd heard so much about it. Right after the first round the world flight, they was coming back, they had made stops in several places, uh, and if I remember correctly, they was coming from Cleveland, Ohio, where they had stopped. Uh, but they had made several stops before that, uh, after they got in here. I mean, before they got in here. And, uh, but it was just something for a kid to see. <laughs> 
we went out, drove out to the airport, and uh, like I say, there must have been eight or nine hundred people out there milling around, and the airplane was the main item. Wiley was a worldwide hero, yet when he and May returned to their hotel room, he asked the question, is that all there is? Suffering from depression most of his life, Wiley thought he was a failure and had given nothing to aviation. No matter what Wiley thought about himself, his mother and father, his closest friends, and his brothers and sister always believed in him. The oldest one was James, and then Arthur, and then my father Joe, and Wiley, and Byron, and Gordon were the boys. One time, and let's see, it was after his first around the world flight, he conned somebody into letting him shoot coyotes at Fort Sale. And he flew down to Walters in a biplane, two-wing airplane, and got my father to go with him to shoot coyotes on Fort Sale. And uh, after the first day, my daddy told him he didn't want any more of that damn flying and wouldn't go. So while he went and shot one of the struts out on the airplane, trying to shoot a coyote and fly the airplane at the same time and lit and fixed it with some bailing wire. He wasn't as tall as I am. I walked up beside him and I'd say that, you know, his height at that time, he maybe a couple of inches shorter than I am. He was a kind of a solid made small man. And uh, he had a, a, a grin that would disarm you, you know. He, he was friendly and he talked to people. Wiley, uh, he enjoyed uh, performing and he enjoyed the crowd that came to see him and he enjoyed visiting with the people. He'd shake hands with you, you know, that's more than a lot of people will do, you know. Well, it was quite a man, quite a life. <laughs> of course, at 10 years old, I wasn't in any position to uh, have a thorough knowledge of Wiley Post at all. He was, he was simply a hero, a living hero. And uh, I recall one, one day specifically that stands out in my mind even more than the day of his death. And my dad was uh, kind of steering him around town and as, as his promotion man and uh, publicity person. And uh, he brought him by the house on 17th Street in Oklahoma City. And by prearrangement, my sister, Will Ann, and I came out there. And we had our picture taken with Wiley. And uh, it, we were, you talk about show and tell, you know. For a seven or eight year old kid, that's pretty fine wine. He and my daddy would talk. Uh, now, my dad was very intelligent. He lost his eyes, both of them, when he was 16. And he went ahead and uh, went to that blind school in Little Rock. And then when my daddy died, he owned 365 farms, rent houses, business houses. And uh, he did that blind. And with Wally, with that one eye, you know, they had a bond there. And um, they would talk. Uh, and I would sit and listen to them instead of being outside playing. I would sit and listen to them talk. Wally always told me, he said, uh, try it. If you want to do it, why well, try it. And if you fail, why well, ask yourself why you failed and how come you failed. And then try it again and, and uh, you know, re remedy that. And I, I can look back now at my life and while I had an impact on it, an awful impact because he said, never give up. Wiley had more dreams. In 1933, he developed a plan to fly alone around the earth in the Winnie Mae. He bought the airplane from F.C. Hall. With the help of Daily Oklahoman editor Walter Harrison, Oklahoma City business leaders such as Stanley Draper and E.K. Gaylord, 
and Yukon Milling Company owner John Crodel, Wiley was able to raise funds necessary to finance the Around the World trip. Forty-one Oklahomans, including a young newspaper reporter, Mike Monroney, contributed the $40,000 Wiley needed. Just three months before Wiley was to make his solo flight around the world, an accident in Chickasha one afternoon almost changed history forever. With his friend Red Gray at the controls of the Winnie Mae, Wiley was in the passenger seat. One day, Red was there at Chickasha. Now, they brought that plane into Chickasha because it was the only one that had an airstrip big enough to accommodate this Winnie Mae. It was... It landed like a streamlined brick. Well, Wiley and Red got in the plane, and uh, uh, Red uh, turned the key. Now, this is no, uh, it's a single seat. Uh, you have one fellow right close to you, but there's not like a bi uh, where we have the two pilots in the front. This plane was narrow. And he turned the key on, and of course, anybody's flying, we always look if it has a gauge on it. Most of the planes didn't have gauges, but his had a gauge, and it showed zero. Uh, while it said, well, I just put fuel in there a day or two ago, and it must be that the gauges are not uh, registering right. So the Red said, well, okay, we'll fire it up, and they got about 50 foot in the air, and it quit and obviously ran out of gas. So uh, due to his ability, he was able to get the plane down. Uh, due to the speed and the shortness of this uh, airstrip, there was a peach orchard at the end of that airstrip down there at Chickasha, and, uh, and he caught the right wing in a tree, and of course it spun him around what I'm about to read is taken from my father's book, which is still in manuscript form, hasn't been published. And it portrays what happened back in 1933, of when Wiley was wanting to go from around the world. And the plane crashed in Chickasha. And I'd like to read. Gray calling my dad, telling him of the crash. Dad immediately dispatched a truck, and a crew trucked the ship back to the hangar in Oklahoma City to be rebuilt. As the story goes, by now, Wiley was broke and was out promoting while the plane sat in the hangar. Dad put Luther Gray, Claude Seaton, George Brower, and Ster Sterling E. Berry to work on rebuilding the wrecked aircraft. They and my dad had the balance owed on the repairs against the Winnie Mae to be charged back against their back salary. Wiley got off and commenced his round-the-world flight, but Wiley never forgot his friends. And the proof of that is the checks signed by Wiley paying back these men each one every cent owed and possibly a little bit more. So I immediately went over to the old Curtis Wright airport. I had forgotten that Wiley was over there and asked for a job. They said, well, go out to the coffee shack out there and see the boss. So I go out there and the boss is talking to Wiley. Wally said, what the hell are you doing over here? I said, well, I'm looking for a job. So he turned to this man and said, put him on my airplane. He said, he's a good man. So I worked there till the airplane was finished. It was a plywood airplane, as you know. And uh, I did repair work on replacing that plywood. Well, the wing was damaged and the fuselage was damaged because it landed in the peach orchard had to crash through a tree or two. So it needed some repair, yeah. He would sit out there in the airplane for hours on end, was just tied down with the engine running to get used to the noise of it. 
because he knew he would be flying solo. Part of my job was replacing the damaged wood, and uh, I just saved this piece of it and had Wally decide it there, which he did. And, uh, there's another fellow who had a larger piece of it. I forget what his name was. So they removed about six or seven foot of that tip, and um, and then they removed it and uh, threw it out in the back of that hangar out there in the weeds. And I either flew in there one day or I drove in, and I was walking around that hangar, and there was that piece of that wing out there. Well, um, it was pretty well shattered, and there was a piece there, oh, 12, 14 inches square, that I just picked up. And uh, by the way, those, that plywood is always covered with what they call balloon cloth. It's, um, it's a tough fabric. The New York Times again bought exclusive rights to cover Wiley's flight around the world in 1933. The newspaper sent reporters to cities around the world, cities where Wiley would stop to refuel. Wiley wore a white patch over his left eye as a hint of daybreak began to spread itself across the swampland near Floyd Bennett Field in New York on July 15, 1933. Wiley released the brakes and the Winnie Mae went charging down the runway. She was airborne and on her way around the world again. Wiley stopped in Berlin and Moscow and several cities in Russia and Siberia. Wiley flew from New York to Berlin in just under 26 hours. New York, direct to Berlin, Germany. It was a far different Germany in 1933 than when Wiley landed in Berlin in 1931. Swastikas began appearing after young Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany just five months before Wiley's visit. Fatigue was already wearing on Wiley. A New York Times correspondent described Wiley's physical condition as plainly showing the effects of his flight across the ocean. His dark gray suit was spick and span, but his face was drawn, and his one good eye was bloodshot. After a two-hour delay in Berlin, Wiley took off for Moscow and began having problems immediately with the Sperry autopilot. He had to manually fly blind using the gyroscopes in the autopilot. From there, it was a stressful 13-hour and 15-minute flight to Novosibirsk. I was in Russia with my father. My sister and I went over to Russia to be with Dad. He was building the only two electrolytic zinc plants in the Soviet Union. And so then when Wiley decided he was going to do this solo flight around the world, he knew I was still in Russia. And so he sent me a cable and asked me if I would... Uh, help get his fuel dumps and, and his maps and the weather and all the visas and things he needed to get across Russia and then meet him in Novosibirsk and then after we'd fueled there to fly with him to Khabarovsk to help him on the other eastern flight for Russia and uh, of course he wanted to help him set his record and uh, you know show him what great people the Russians were and <laughs> So they were very cooperative, and there was no airline, no way of getting out there except on the railroad. So they let me fly out in the mail plane, and they put me in the, in the plane, and then they piled the mail around me and flew me out to Novosibirsk. They made the maps, and uh, he told me where he wanted to go. You know, he wanted to go to Novosibirsk, and Utkutsk, and Khabarovsk, and, and so they mapped it out for him and, and, uh, try, and got the fuel out there for the, for him. And uh, then, of course, when he came into Russia, why, uh, and finally got to Novosibirsk, he had to tell me that I couldn't go because the NAA had ruled that two pilots in the plane would have spoiled his solo record, so I couldn't go with him. So we kept pers trying to persuade him to stay and sleep a few hours, you know, but he he wouldn't do it. He was behind the schedule, and, and uh, he wanted to make up the time. And uh, it was a wonderful have the privilege of watching him 
cope with a situation like that that was a very difficult one. I mean, a lot of people would have said, well, I'll get a few hours sleep and then I'll be brighter and carry on. But that wasn't Wiley's attitude at all. He had a job to do. He went at it till he finished it. And it was a great lesson for him. Another interesting thing he told me was that on the second trip around the world that the carburetor froze. He was up pretty high. And of course the engine quit. And he figured he was down about 10 feet off the waves when the engine picked up again. Truly flying by the seat of his pants, Wiley negotiated his way across Siberia, the Bering Strait, and over Alaska where he was lost for seven hours. When he spotted a village and landed, the Winnie Mae tipped over onto the sand and bent the propeller. With a hammer and a two-by-four, Wiley straightened the propeller and went on his way. The nation anxiously awaited Wiley's return. Live radio broadcasts from cities along the route alerted listeners that Wiley was flying the Winnie Mae from Canada to the East Coast. There was sheer pandemonium at Floyd Bennett Field as Wiley landed. Reporters from newspapers all over the globe sent dispatches that called Wiley the world's greatest pilot and history's most admired adventurer. Wiley was presented a gold medal, and New York City gave him an even bigger ticker tape parade than that after his first flight in 1931. Wiley and May were received by President Roosevelt at the White House the next day. Wiley asked himself again, is that all there is? He had conquered the world. He had flown alone around the world in an airplane made of thin plywood. What frontiers lay ahead for this one-eyed pilot from Oklahoma? There just wasn't any doubt about it. He was the world's number one pilot at that time. And we appreciated that. And uh, the fact that he was from Oklahoma and uh, taking the time to travel around the state with the Winnie Mae impressed us very much. Well, no, the uh, only other time I was with him besides uh, out at the airport was uh, Keith Kale and I went over to his house one night. Well, we had started a little magazine called Taxi Strip. And uh, Wiley called me and said that uh, Amelia Earhart was going to be there and at his home and would we like to come over. So I got to Keith and we went over there one evening. And Amelia was questioning him about long overseas flights and what goes on, how to stay awake and all this. And Wiley solved his problem by tying a wrench to one finger so that if he dozed off, well, this wrench would drop and wake him up. Uh, on the Wiley Post subject at Maysville, I got a call from Collins, the editor of Pathé News in New York. He said, I want you to go down and, and get an interview of the Wiley Post family, uh, the father and the mother, and ask them uh, about uh, Wiley Post and, uh, and get an interview from them. I understand they're farm folks, so try and get something of their house in their background and show their way of life and then get their interview and, and get their talk and opinion, let them talk. And we just uh, posed them in front of the house and that was it. Because I wanted to get a background of their house to show their living facilities, how they live, typical farm people. Mr. and Mrs. Post, what do you think about your son's flight around the world? I think it's just wonderful, and I certainly will be glad when he returns. I'm so anxious to see him. I bet you are. Well, I can say that I'm still not much interested in aviation. But I suppose if he makes this flight safely, it'll be a great achievement. But I'm in hopes he'll be satisfied and never undertake any more such hazardous trips. For we worry about him so much while he's gone. Wiley was employed by Frank Phillips and the Phillips Petroleum Company to promote the new Phillips 77 aviation fuel. Wiley believed that if an airplane could fly above 40,000 feet, strong winds could push the airplane to unheard of speeds. Wiley knew that the human body could not withstand the pressure at high altitudes. The Winnie Mae was made of plywood and could not be pressurized, so Wiley decided to pressurize himself. He developed a pressurized flying suit, the forerunner of the modern spacesuit. 
With the help of the B.F. Goodrich Company, a suit made from rubberized parachute material was constructed. Wiley looked like a man from Mars. Now, a lot of people remember that the airplane was invented by the Wright brothers. But how many people remember that the space suit that the astronauts wear was invented by Wiley Post? Wiley had to have a way to get his airplane to high altitude. And what he did was take a Navy full-pressure diving suit and replace the brass dome on it with an aluminum can and used air from the engine. And with that, he was able to have a little bit of pressure in it and could fly at high altitudes. So every time I would put on my suit to make my space flights, I'd remember Wiley Post invented this device. I was a young reporter, one year out of college, and I was uh, interested in aviation because in those days I was stupid enough to fly in anything. And when I heard that Wiley Post was going to be up in Bartlesville and uh, try to set an altitude record, of course, it was obvious I had to go up and take a look at it. It was a much more informal world, you know. He wasn't surrounded by press agents. He wasn't protected by a, by a corporation apparatus. He was just a guy who was going to go up and try to get up higher than anybody else. And those of us who gathered around him at the Bartleville Airport asked him any kind of questions we wanted. It was, it was a very naive but a kind of a nice era. Uh, when we came out here, there was quite a group of people collecting around on the runway. And so, uh, in standing around for maybe 30 minutes, we heard that Wiley was preparing to put on his spacesuit. Well, we could see a little of it through the doors, but there was quite a bit of crowd of people there. But when he came outside to put the hood on, he had a couple guys helping him and they put the hood on and bolted it down all the way around. He sort of moved and bent over and did different things to see how much action or activity he could have in that spacesuit. And Winnie Mae was already sitting there, warmed up, and he went out and climbed in Winnie Mae. And when he took off, he went up probably eight or nine hundred feet I would guess and circled the airport and then he just continued to circle the airport until he became just a little black speck in the sky. Well this sort of ended the excitement here and we visited around and they had a couple of indoors selling uh, hot dogs and such as that where we could get a little something to eat and we thought probably in two hours why well, this would be over. And so we waited and the two hours ended and it's one of those times in the winter when the days are pretty short. And along about four, everybody was getting very worried and we hadn't heard anything from Wiley. And everybody kept asking, what's the latest report? Or what do you hear? Do you hear anything? And Nobody had heard anything. Finally, just about dusk, I'd say probably uh, remembering that it was after four and before five o'clock, a phone call came here to the airport that Wiley had got into a lot of turbulence in the air and it had taken him off course and that he had to just fly with it and so he came down at Muskogee and landed with a dead stick. After five years of faithful service, the Winnie Mae was tired. She had flown around the world twice, and Wiley looked for a newer and faster airplane. Others were afraid for Wiley to continue to fly the Winnie Mae. What I fear is the loss of the Winnie Mae through a crack-up incident to a forced landing, in ugly terrain after her wheels have been abandoned. This ship ought to be slung up in the Smithsonian alongside of Lindbergh's Ryan monoplane which made the flight to Paris. It's one of the most famous ships extant, has a tremendous historic value. 
It should be a matter of great pride to the state of Oklahoma that so much was won for aviation in the Winnie Mae by an Oklahoma farm lad. I do not know what sort of a deal Post has with Frank Phillips, but I know that Phillips appreciates the relic value of the trim white monoplane. Wiley bought parts from two crashed airplanes and combined them into a sleek new Orion Explorer. He was already planning a flight to look for additional airmail routes across Siberia. He came to New York and and uh, we had breakfast at a, a um, hotel and uh, he asked me if I would go with him to Siberia at, uh, and would I get the visas for he and his wife and myself because I just come back from Siberia, I mean from the Soviet Union and he knew I knew everybody in the embassy and so I said sure I'd be delighted and so I got the visas for him and uh, he said he was going to go by way of Alaska and across the Bering Sea and down into Siberia and into Moscow and we'd probably go around, the, finish the trip around the western way. And so I was in uh, Detroit at an air show on my way to California to go with Wiley and my husband called and said that uh, he had just been hired by the New York Herald Tribune to cover the Italo-Ethiopian War from the Abyssinian side. And did I still want to go with Wiley or did I want to have my honeymoon in Ethiopia covering a war? And of course I thought about two seconds and I called Wiley and told him I was sorry I couldn't go. And uh, so I went to the war with my husband and I'm here and he went picked Wiley proposed, I mean, Will Rogers. Of course, Wiley could have picked anybody he wanted. Everybody was anxious to fly with Wiley. So that was twice I got gypped out of flying with Wiley, but I'm still here. <laughs> Wiley and Will took their time in Alaska, hunting and fishing and visiting old friends like bush pilot Joe Crossan, who helped Wiley chart a course for Barrow, the northernmost point of Alaska. On August 15, 1935, Wiley and Will headed for Barrow. Because of the rain and fog, Wiley was lost. Soon he saw smoke curling from an Eskimo fishing village. He landed in a shallow river. After receiving instructions for Barrow, Wiley took off. The engine failed, and the airplane crashed into the river. At that tragic moment, on a frozen tundra at the top of the world, Oklahoma lost its two most famous citizens. Oh, we were terribly shocked, of course. That was really big news. Big news all over the world, though. As a matter of fact, much bigger news for Wiley Post than for Will Rogers, because most of the world had never read or heard Will Rogers. Most of the world couldn't speak English. But everybody knew about Wiley Post, so as far as the death of the two people was concerned, as a world story, uh, Post's death was much bigger than Roger's death. Keith Kale, he was a reporter on um, Aviation Magazine, The Taxi Strip, and he and Burl Tibbs was here in Marlowe and uh, up at my daddy's office uh, uh, taking an interview with my daddy as Ben Wally's first passenger and then uh, me of um, him getting me started flying and and while we were up there they were up there and we was having the interview why somebody called and said that um, they had been killed you know while in will and um, well you could have heard a pin drop for a minute of course and um, well they all knew him of course Burl was real buddies with him, and we all, we all cried. We all cried. I think everybody was ready to lower their flag to half mast and, and put on black or something to try to show their appreciation for two pioneers in, in America and in Oklahoma that had been lost, and it was it was just something irreplaceable. There hadn't been any more Will Rogers, and we really haven't had any more Wiley Post.
the, the comments were, what in the world was he doing up that far into in the no man's land? Uh, it was as far as you could go, Point Barrow, wasn't it? And uh, they went up there, and it was, uh, as I recall, it wasn't good weather, and they, well, they, they couldn't figure out why Will Rogers wanted to go up there. And uh, to this day, I don't know. I would have went. Of course, I'm just, I guess I'm just opposed. At, at the time, any big thing that happened, the newspapers ran an extra. And the Hindenburg in New Jersey burned. And I don't remember the date, but it seemed to me like that was in May of 35. And Wiley and uh, Will Rogers was killed on August 15th of 35, which was my mother's birthday, but I saw extras on both of those occasions. Uh, I don't know, we made 30 or 40 cents that day uh, selling extras. I was at a camp in Wisconsin with my sister, and uh, there were some other Oklahoma City kids up there. And uh, I forget now how I heard it. But I recall thinking, well, this is going to be something I'll remember all of my life. I, I think I, I learned to cherish those moments from my dad, who kind of beat it into my head, <laughs> that hey, this is important, I'll remember it. And, and surely enough, uh, from that vantage point, I knew that was an enormous thing for my dad because uh, both Will and Wiley had been very dear friends. And uh, I know that it really uh, kicked the props out from under him. Fort Sale, Oklahoma, August 16, 1935. The news from Alaska is like a nightmare. The mind does not want to accept the ghastly word that Will Rogers, Oklahoma's most popular son, and Wiley Post, Oklahoma's greatest aviator, have been rubbed out in a moment like ordinary mortals who sometimes fall from the clouds. Within hours after the deaths of Wiley and Will, their old friend Charles Lindbergh took responsibility for getting their bodies home from Alaska. Joe Crossan personally risked his life and flew in rain and fog from Barrow to California, where Will's body was delivered. He then flew on to Oklahoma City. 8,000 people met the plane carrying Wiley's body at the Oklahoma City airport. The funeral of Wiley Post was the largest in state history. His body first was taken to his hometown of Maysville, and then lay in state in the rotunda of the capital. Biggest crowd this country bumpkin had ever seen in my entire life in here in Oklahoma City. And I remember the funeral in Maysville at the Landmark Baptist Church. Oh, it was a rather uh, sad, sad feeling because the people knew each other real well. Well, as I recall, being pretty young, there wasn't too much that, other than the fact that we went out to, to see him lying in state. There was a crowd of people there that, oh, I would say numbered in the hundreds, going around, taking their turns, seeing him. And my dad and Tom and Bess and my mother, Marie, we all worked around to where we could get close to him because they knew him very well. And I, I always admired the man because he was a pilot. He flew a plane. I remember the flowers, the flags being there, um, the casket with him in it, of course, and the people wanting 
while straining to get closer. They had a rope deal around to keep people out of distance, but they were <laughs> pushing against the rope to get a closer look was a man that held a lot of respect from a lot of people and it showed up that day of his uh, funeral while we're, uh, being in state, lying in state at the Capitol. They came out to see him from all over the state. All there was in the headline of the paper that next morning was Wally and Will Rogers got killed. So uh, Chuck Burkett was a principal in the schools here at Noble later on, but he's my teacher at Little Canada School up to eighth grade, and he and his wife asked me to go. So we went to uh, the capital, and I never saw as many people in my country boy really <laughs> saw something the first time, because I think there's 20,000 at one Maybe the Baptist the funeral, the just, and there's out people outside that couldn't even get in, and I don't know what it was at the Capitol, probably more than that. So they had him there in state at the Capitol, and the entrance of the door rotunda, they call it, and uh, we was uh, we was short enough line that we could make it because some never got through it, and we passed in, re in re review of him. And uh, just as we was going down the steps, or there must be 50 steps that's high, you know, um, there was a flight of aircraft, and I don't know how many of there was, as most I'd ever seen in one formation. Um, they flew over, and uh, they throttled back, dropped flowers, and it was... Uh, Real exciting, and it kind of got you right here, because you figured you knew him, and then they th throttled back up and went on, and then uh, you know they have the flight of the missing, like in, in wartime, uh, they have the three airplanes flying, and then this one, they got a big uh, place there for a missing plane, and that's supposed to be Wally. I think. It's, he's going to be a reference point now and in the future. A lot of things that he did are being publicized more today than they have been for several years. They're beginning to realize that he brought forth a lot of ideas and that he set a pattern for people to follow that were interested in flying and uh, I think probably you'd have to say he was a pioneer in the field. He looked to the future and he told me, he said, when you do anything and um, when you're doing it, don't think about just doing it then or tomorrow, the next day. Look way ahead and see what, uh, what effect it would have way ahead of you. And look to the future and never look, look back but look to the future and not just the next day, the next year, but in the future, what, what would happen then? He was so far ahead of the average uh, pilot aviator. I mean, his vision of the high pressure suit, the pressure suit, and his vision of getting up in the jet stream, that, that was gonna be the normal place to fly. I mean, we had, we were still 200 feet off the ground, you know, trying to make a landing somewhere. And, and he was way up in the heavens. And he was um, a very deep thinker. And uh, he had visions, like Amelia said in 1934, that no new worlds to conquer this side of the moon. And at the same time, Wiley was breaking his pressure suits, you know. It was, uh, they were two extremely unusual people both who had vision and both who carried them through. And uh, I had a great privilege knowing both of them. He knew, he knew these things could come about. He could look in the future. He's somewhat of a dreamer. It takes a pilot to be a dreamer to get where he's going. <laughs> uh, this man knew what he wanted to do.
I mean, you know, the Winnie Mae and Wiley Post, both together in my mind. It has been more than six decades since Wiley Post flew alone around the earth. For the rest of time, whenever aviation buffs gather to sip coffee and talk about the magnetic topic of flying, Wiley's personal achievement of soloing around the world in the plywood contraption known as the Winnie Mae will be called the most unique flight in all of aviation history. His pressurized flying suit was the forerunner of the modern space suit. His discoveries paved the way for man to visit the moon and beyond. Whenever you see an astronaut walking in space, safe within a pressurized suit, think of Wiley. The next time you ride in a jetliner cruising along at ease at 35,000 feet, think of Wiley and his Winnie Mae climbing into the stratosphere over Bartlesville. As man strives to build even better spaceships to reach farther into the universe, every advance will carry a bit of Wiley's dream. In terms of human endurance and achievement, Wiley Post was the world's greatest pilot for all time.